Hey everybody, my name's Harry. Uh, I'm going to try to do a little tutorial here for you. I noticed when I first started doing wood carving that there wasn't a whole lot of uh, actual tutorial videos out there. A lot of videos like I do of uh, time lapse and stuff and actually getting down to the how to carve is uh, it's really not that complicated which is probably the reason there's not a whole lot of videos out there. But if you have no idea where to get started, practicing wrong or practicing with like a pocket knife on a piece of oak or something and you're going to have a really hard time. Um, I would suggest first using a piece of basswood. This is actually butternut, which is also a good wood if you can get your hands on it. Um, basswood you could probably get at your local Michaels or a craft store like that. Look around, um, they have like clock making supplies and um, like wood letters and things like that for making signs. Uh, you might find it's like basswood blanks there. Uh, if you get into it then you might have to find a uh, local lumber yard or online and order some and get it sent to you. But if you try to use a bad wood you're gonna have a you're gonna have a rough time. Even like uh, pine is very common but it's it splits very easy and it, to carve on it it's, you're gonna struggle a little bit. I would suggest starting on basswood or butternut or mahogany if you can get your hands on it but mahogany is definitely a little more pricey. Alright well I, I suggest getting started with chip carving. You can get a chip carving knife like this for anywhere from 15 to maybe 25 30 dollars. Um, it's a flex cut. I also have a file um, carving knife, chip carving knife, and um, again, it's about the same price. And you might not be into chip carving in general. You might be more into trying to get into relief carving or carving in the round. Uh, I'm not really going to cover any whittling, like uh, like where they're holding a block like this and whittling. I'm not very good at that. I've, and it's not really the style I do. I do more relief carving myself, but. That being said, chip carving is a good place to start. I started with chip carving and it's amazing the results you can get. And everything you learn in chip carving can definitely carry over to relief carving. And even just having the knife, you might not use the knife nearly as much when you start relief carving, but having it, it's, you'll, you will use it occasionally. And uh, until you get a uh, bigger set built up, I'm going to try and get present the tools in like the order that you might want to buy them. Um, so I would say this would be a f pretty good first investment, be a chip carving knife. Lots of videos out there on chip carving. Just Google chip carving and you can see some examples, some beautiful work that people have done. Um, I'm not going to go too far into the how-tos of chip carving. I might just do a couple quick little examples and uh, then I'm going to probably time-lapse the rest of me working on this which is this going to be a chip carving. Alright let me show you a couple of examples of uh, chip carvings I've done in the past. Here's one. If you notice this is nothing more than a bunch of little tiny chips taking it and taking out. Now I kind of have a tendency of overdoing my chip carvings, I should probably leave a little bit more uncarved. This is actually a relief carving with some chip carving around the border. And this is one of the first attempts I ever made at chip carving. And I, just to show you that uh, something like a, a basket weave design or something can very easily be achieved with chip carving. All right, here I have a little piece of basswood. This is a uh, block. They sell these for like uh, practice blocks. I really don't even suggest getting them. The reason I have it lying around is because I've had it for years and haven't used it. Um, but for practicing, I suppose it'll work and uh, something that I can easily spin around and try and keep in camera. Um, basic chip carving. You're basically going to try and make like an inverted pyramid right here. So the center of this pyramid right here, you're going to make three planes basically, and that will be the bottom 
point. So you're going to plunge the knife in. A lot of times we, with chip carving, you're kind of plunging the knife in, not slicing as much. But a lot of times I'll slice first just to score where so the blade uh, follows that score line a little bit easier. Just for my own uh, peace of mind, I know people who are really good at it don't necessarily have to do that step. I'll show you like a little bit here. Just barely scoring it. Now, the idea is to push this tip of this knife in to where the tip of it ends up right about to the center of that. So, I mean, you'll have to put a little oomph on it. And the idea of a chip carving knife, I'm sorry, I should have went over this first, is to hold it like this. You're pulling the blade towards you. It's one of the few uh, knives in wood carving that you're actually going to face the blade towards yourself. Um, it's always dangerous when you have the blade facing yourself, but with chip carving you're almost always plunging the blade deep into the wood. It's not very likely to slip, it doesn't seem. Um, the idea is to hold it like this and then keep your knuckle on, on the board basically. So as you're plunging the knife in here, you're trying to keep that general angle of the knife and then as you work your way around the entire carving you're keeping that angle more or less the same so the smaller the piece you're cutting out the shallower the cuts gonna be the deep the bigger the piece you're trying to cut out the deeper the knife will go in because of the angle it's going down if that makes any sense here I'll continue this with this piece though now once you get your tip down to where you want it to be you could kind of pivot the knife to get some of that next cut. Now on the edge here, by the points of the triangle here, it will be its shallowest. Where this comes together with this, it's only going to be very shallow, but in the center it's going to be the deepest. So you're going to go deep to shallow. Shallow. I'll just score it first. Shallow to deep in the center same here now if all of your points met up which it probably won't <laughs> um, the piece will just pop out most likely you'll do as like I just did especially when you're not all that practiced at it you will uh, have a little bit hanging there. It's okay if it's just hanging by a little bit, but don't pry with the knife. You'll break these knives. They're very delicate compared to like a buck knife or something like that. The tip of this one was actually broken off already. I had to resharpen it. When you first start, very good chance you're going to pry, but try not to pry. You shouldn't have to pry. If, if you're prying, that means it's not cut all the way through. So there you have it. Not the cleanest, but doing this on the fly here. Again, this knife has had its tip broken off. If you have a nice new one, the point will be a little longer, which will help it get down into that crevice a little bit better. The idea is to do it in one nice smooth cut so that you end up with a nice flawless plane that doesn't have to be cleaned up too much. Um, if you're doing it nice and clean, you won't even have to clean them up at all, but I'm not very to that level yet. But, okay, now you have one of them. Now, say you did another one right next to it. I would start with the cut pushing away from the, from the existing cuts, because this piece right here will be the weakest point, and it could snap off the easiest. So push the blade away from existing cuts whenever possible. Score it first. Plunge that center down. And kind of rock it out. And 
Now, whether or not you should go with the grain first, against the grain first, it's really not as important as you think in chip carving, it doesn't seem. You're almost always going to have to, in one way or the other, go with or against the grain. It's more worried about the weak spots, like, like the, in between here. I, sh I think I generally go like across the grain first whenever possible, but I don't know if that's the correct way of going about it. The grain chip carving is not like when you do the grain when you're relief carving. When you're relief carving, it's pretty important that you you understand where your grain's at, or you'll end up splitting a huge chunk out of it. Here you're kind of going about it in a different way. You're not going to end up making a massive mistake because you're going against the grain really because you're making slices and a slice by its general nature one side of the one side of the blade is going with the grain and the other side of the knife is going against the grain so it's a no-win situation. But you can see if you made several of these in a row or going around the border of something that you can easily make uh, a lot of different patterns and just about anything can be turned into a closed, uh, like a triangle or a square. And again, uh, just plunging that knife down to the center of it. I'll show you now. Uh, these are uh, two, would be considered a two-sided piece, whereas these are three-sided. A two-sided piece, instead of having a center point, you're going to have a center line. If this makes sense here. I'll show you a nice small one here. You're going to imagine a center line going right here. And then when you're making your cut, again, I'll score it first just to make sure I don't slip out of it. And then you're going to try and make that point go down to that center line. Now, you almost develop a second sense after a while. You will cut yourself a few times and you will quickly learn not to do that. Right there, when I'm pulling this knife and my thumb is here, I have like a spider sense goes off and I say, no, get that hand out of the way. Just in case it slips out. The blade always wins if you fight against it. Your skin will cut every bit as easy as this. Woodwill. So you see that little slice there. Now, you can see that if you wanted to make some kind of like a you know, plant decoration or something, that you're just making little slices like a brush stroke almost. How quick it really could uh, come to life for you. It's really not a lot of work, especially with the shallower cuts like this. Because the piece isn't very big, the cut will be pretty shallow. Now I know some people might be watching this and screaming, going, oh my god, you're horrible at this chip carving, but doing it on uh, camera and on a whim here is a little bit challenging. I am definitely not the best at it. I moved on from chip carving pretty quickly to relief carving, but it definitely taught me a lot about it. And it's when you're cleaning up chips that you will start to understand how grain works and what's more likely to catch and what's not. Yeah, so I watch a lot of YouTube videos on everything from drawing, carving, everything. And I felt it was my time to give back a little bit. 
make some videos. I'm starting to get develop a little bit of a following on my channel. And uh, again, there's not a whole lot of videos on actually how to. And, uh, but I think you'll find it's not all that complicated, really. Okay, so if you're better at this, you'll get these cuts a little cleaner. But you can see how quick you can make like a, a decorative border or something. Now, an interesting thing is I'm trying to sell you on uh, chip carving here. And some of this could actually be a uh, can be accomplished pretty easily with the second tool I'm going to mention, and that is a V-tool. Now, when it comes to actually uh, relief carving, I'm not a even huge fan of the V-tool, and I know some people use it a lot in relief carving. They use it almost as their pencil to constantly uh, outline everything. I use a carving knife to, to uh, make my stop cuts. A lot of people will use a V-tool to make their stop cuts. Um, so whether or not you want to buy a V-Tool as your second tool is kind of up to you, but I'll show you that it's something as shallow as these cuts are, how quick you could do these with a V-Tool, which is a kind of a gouge, I guess you'd say, but pretty much every, uh, every chisel is just a knife, and that's really the way to think of it. This knife blade is the same as this blade right here. It's just shape different, that's all. They're all just knives. and this. So, like I was saying about the blade, with a VTOL, it's especially true that one side of it is going to be going with the grain, and the other side of it is going to be going against the grain. So, a VTOL, to be properly work, has got to be very sharp, which is kind of its biggest drawback, because sharpening a VTOL is a little bit of a challenge. But, if you're going shallow cuts like this, let's just say in between each of these leaves, I wanted to make another. Well, with a VTOL, all I have to do is stab it in there, push a little harder when I'm in the center and there you have it so oop, a little slippage there but you can see that what I mean as far as this this tool is I'll show you another usage for it here too but if you're you're not making huge cuts something like this might might work a little better for you but you're not really chip carving at that point chip carving is generally just using this knife okay let me show you one more thing here I'll try and make this video relatively quick um, let's say the chip I want to do is bigger let's say it's a pretty big chip I want to take out here Okay, the first thing you're going to find out is when you start to cut this, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to plunge that knife into the center where it needs to be. Center being about here, and in this case, well, that distance from here to here is going to be roughly the same distance deep you're going to go. So, you're going to not be able to get there before this knife has just got a lot of resistance against it. Again, this is a time where to the V-tool could work for you. One way to go about it would be to dig some of this wood out with the V-tool first, trying to stay inside of the lines first. All of the wood that you remove will relieve tension. It's going to look sloppy at first, but now when you go to make this cut, now this wood has got some place to move. You see, as it'll, it'll it'll fold in now because it's got that empty space to fold into, and you can finish off your cup like that. Now it's still going to be a little more work making these deeper ones, but as you can see, the bigger the piece that you that you draw, the deeper the chip carving you're going to get. But just removing that little bit with that V-tool gave it the, uh, the room to move to where this could now get plunged in there to where it needs to be. Now, as I said before, I'm 
kind of rushing and doing this stuff on tape is not the easiest deal. But that's one way. But you can also use a V-tool in your chip carving. You know, they, technically, you wouldn't be chip carving anymore. But another way to do that with the chip carving knife would be another big piece I wanted to take out. Would be simply to make a smaller chip out of the center first. Which would basically do the same thing. It's going to relieve some of that wood, relieving some of the pressure, giving the space for these next cuts to fold into. The wood's always going to crack in the direction of least resistance. Which is why when I was showing you here, you want to push away from the cuts you've already made. Because uh, less resistance that way, otherwise the piece will just break off. It would rather break that piece off once you put that much pressure on there. If I'm sure that's, I'm overthinking it, that's pretty self-explanatory. So yes, you'll see again how that just, just chip carving a smaller piece out of the middle works the same. It re, it's a relief cut, not really carving, but a relief cut. A relief cut is to relieve that pressure of the wood so that when you are making your cut, the wood has got some place to move to. Alright, one thing that's good about chip carving is that you can do a lot of it on your lap which is a lot more relaxing. When I'm doing uh, relief carving with chisels, I have to generally have to uh, clamp down my board and I have to stand up so I can get over top of it and start working, which is great, but sometimes you just feel like sitting down at the end of the day and you can, you can still do some chip carving. It actually takes more wrist power to chip carve than it does to carve with chisels. Your wrist has to stab in and the wider those chips get, the more it's gonna fight you. If you're going to go shallow, somebody smaller, like, like this, these smaller cuts be pretty easy. You can basically just stab, 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 and it pops out. Excuse me. Alright. Now, on uh, chip carving like this, these are all pretty wide. Let me see if I can zoom in here, I can show you. The pattern I drew here is actually pretty wide. Here's my finger, to give you an idea. These, uh, I could probably chip them out in one slice, but they're going to resist me pretty good. So in this case, I might go around, now I wouldn't do this part necessarily on my lap, but in each one of these that I want to remove, I might go through, say, I'm going to do this side of this piece next. So this next side here, I might go through here and remove some of this with the V-tool. Or a uh, a gouge if you had one would also work. But a V-tool, a lot of people will use uh, that. Just again relieves some of that pressure on that wood. So now, when I go to make this next cut, this wood is much more likely to break that way, in which is the direction I want it to break off. So I guess you can call that a a. Uh, hybrid chip carving method where you're using chip carving for the most part but you're using one of the tools from relief carving and the wider the piece gets the more likely you're gonna have to clean it up I know some of these guys are really good to have they have channels of their own just in chip carving and they make it look easy but for the most part you'll probably have to go back and clean up every piece but it's really not that long. Now, if you counted every piece that needs to be chipped out of this, it seems like it might be. It might seem like a lot, but it's really not. It's you know maybe 50, 60 pieces or something that need to be chipped out of here. And then, and just in the course of this video, I've already shown you one while talking. And if you get some patterns where it's laid out in like a grid, you can cut several cuts without even having to move the board.
Here's an example though, right here. Okay, now if I'm cutting this piece, because it's a chip carving knife, I have to hold this angle. So to get this cut, I have to kind of pull this direction. Well, that is against the grain. This grain right here is going to try and catch this knife. I'd be much better off cutting this direction. So sometimes you'll have to make like a hybrid where you're holding it in the opposite. Trying to keep that angle. It's a particularly airy piece of butter not here. It's actually not very hard at all. So there you go. Alright, before I get to the uh, time lapse part here. I'm back standing again and I got this clamp down to show you uh, how I would actually go about making this chip carving a lot easier by making all these relief cuts first. And I put X's on uh, the ones I don't want to cut out. Now, because I can stand over it now, I can put a lot more control over the blade. I, uh, I'm not all the that great with a V tool, which is why I don't use it as much. I find it a little harder to control. I don't use it for stop cuts like most people do. I use it for gouging out excess sometimes. So that's one way of going about it. Another would be <clears throat> with this sort of V tool, which is a, uh, with a handle, and using a mallet. A mallet actually gives you more control, believe it or not, because it's only going to go forward then stop. chip carving cuts much easier given given the wood some place to break out to. That's another way of going about it. Alright, so there it is all finished up. I sanded off the uh, pencil marks and I hit it with a quick coat of pre-stain. I use pre-stain just to uh, kind of shows off where the mistakes are made and where you might need to clean it up a little bit more. It gets the dust off and knocks down some of the little burrs and stuff. Let you lets you know what it's going to look like after you uh, polyurethane it. The pre-stain is dry on this now but it shows me that I need it to a little rough spot here and it'll show up your rough spots before you polyurethane it so that you can go back and work on it that's what I use it for anyhow well that's my first tutorial and if you learned anything or enjoyed it leave me a comment and uh, thanks for watching